from the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, to introduce our speaker. Thanks. Today, Dr. Don Kankel will be leading a Grand Rounds presentation entitled Vaping Consumer Risk Perceptions and Advertising. Dr. Kankel is the Joan K. and Erwin M. Jacobs Professor in the Department of Policy Analysis and Management at Cornell University. He grew up in Lexington, Kentucky and graduated from the University of Kentucky. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. In 2004, he was commissioned a Kentucky Colonel. His expertise is in the areas of health economics and public sector economics. Broadly speaking, most of his research is on the economics of disease prevention and health promotion. He's the author of the chapter on prevention in the Handbook of Health Economics. He's conducted a series of st studies on the economics of public health policies, including alcohol taxes and other policies to prevent alcohol problems, cigarette taxes to prevent youth smoking, and advertising to promote smoking cessation. His current research is on the economics of cigarette sales on Indian reservations, the economics of tobacco regulation, and the market for e-cigarettes. From July 2018 through April 2020, he served as a senior economist and then chief economist at the Council of Economic Advisors in the Executive Office of the President. Our discussant today is Catherine McLean from Temple University. Dr. Kangle will be presenting results from three papers and will have pauses after each paper to allow for clarifying questions, but we'll hold other questions until the Q&A period that will follow the presentation. Dr. Kankel, thank you for presenting for us today. Great. Thank you very much. Um, happy to be here, I'm happy to be virtually here, and I'm glad you, you included my Kentucky colonelship as a, uh, in the introduction, that'll be the first question is what in the world that is, so I, I can take that question later. I'm happy to do this kind of ground rounds presentation. I haven't really done something like this before. Um, but generally speaking, a lot of my recent research falls in this, and ongoing research falls in the title of vaping consumer risk perceptions and advertising. I'll start off with a slide of disclosures about both financing from Cornell, from NIH, and from the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. Um, but at least equally importantly, this gives me a chance to remember to thank all my co-authors, Sita Peng, Mike Pesco, Hua Long, um, Dave Dench, Daniel D Dave, Deval Dave, Daniel Dench, Mike Grossman, Henry Safer, um, and then we start cycling back with some of the other ones, but also Alan Matthews is another one of my current and previous co-authors that have helped in some of the papers that, we, that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so, to overview, I'd say this, I have kind of what I'm considering three main themes in my talk. Um, the first theme is that consumers value their health, and this creates consumer demand for healthier behaviors and healthy tobacco products, healthier tobacco products. We'll talk about how that's not totally oxymoronic in a minute. Um, the second major theme is that private sector advertising, therefore, can promote public health. Um, but of course, public policy matters too. When I looked over the research I'm going to be talking about, I realized that I also have sort of three minor themes about methods, is that the three different studies I'm talking about kind of span three different methods that I think are very useful to be thinking about with um, tobacco markets. Um, the first is to actually set up an experimental market, a discrete choice experiment, uh, to see how consumers state they'll behave. The second method in the second paper is, how, is talking about how to identify advertising effects and observational data, revealed preference data from markets. And the third, mainly ongoing work, partly already published though, um, is thinking about an information shock to markets as a quasi experiment. So we have kind of a, they say, this methodological um, 
minor notes while the major themes of my talk are going to be about the substance. So thinking about the value of health, you know, economists use in cost benefit analysis estimates that the value of a statistical life is about $10 million roughly. There are lots of different estimates, but that's a nice round number. Now the VSL summarizes the estimates of the value of small changes in mortality, not life itself, obviously. Um, and, the, and most of the estimates are based on studies of hedonic studies of wage equations that show that workers are willing to accept lower wages to get safer jobs. So in that way, they reveal how much they value safety. Now, we know that smoking is a very unsafe activity. It's estimated to cause almost 500,000 extra deaths each year and reduce smokers on the average life expectancy by about 10 years. So putting these things together, health economists, several different groups, um, David Cutler, Kip Viscusi, others, have come up with alternative estimates of the value of the health costs that smokers impose on themselves. And as usual in economics, these range a lot, but they value, the value is at least $34 per pack of health costs. So you, um, expressed on a per pack basis that way. So a useful way to think about this, I think, is that you know, when you go out and you buy and then smoke a pack of cigarettes, you've imposed two, two sources of cost. You've imposed a monetary cost on your pocketbook, which might be $10, let's say, in New York State. But you're imposing on future health costs that are worth $34 at least. So maybe the total full price of, of a pack of cigarettes is like $44. And that shows that a change in the perceived health cost can have a very large impact on the perceived price. And so a lot of times economists are studying tax hikes. We think of like a dollar a tax as a big, big tax hike. Um, but, you know, recognizing, you know, wow, if you could change people's perceptions of the health cost of smoking by 10%, that's like a $3.40 tax hike. And I think this has a lot to understand about, you know, what, what has actually happened to smoking over the years, the changes in perceived health costs have shifted smoking probably a lot more than the tax hikes. And this also has some stuff to do with, um, with thinking about how to interpret price elasticities. That's not today's talk, so I'm gonna kind of leave that in a, that's why I put that in, par in parentheses. So this leads me to the point that, wow, then, even smokers want to be healthier. And so this is just a big overview of the last 50 years in smoking. That, you know, back in the 1950s and 60s, the research firmly established the medical, the major health costs of smoking. There is the famous 1964 Surgeon General's report in the US that said smoking is bad for your health. There were similar studies in the UK and other countries and similar public documents. And as a result, there were major changes. Um, smoking prevalence dropped from over 40% in the 60s to less than 20% now and continues to drop. I really like this study by Mendez and Warner back in the late 1990s, where they used a dynamic population simulation model. And they predicted just based on the demography of the smoking population in 1995, what would happen to smoking rates through the next 15 years. And they got it dead on. They hit 2010 prevalence almost exactly. And what this means is that's all that stuff was baked into the demographics. And what do I mean by date baked into the demographics? I mean, the drop we saw from 95 to 2010 was really the result of the fact that smoking initiation had already dropped and smoking cessation had already increased. So by 1995, there were a lot fewer young smokers or middle aged smokers going into those ages where they're going to start. Um, dying and the two and uh, again so they they could predict that and so I think that says a lot about that you know it's that early 1960s 1970s changes in what people knew about the health hazards of smoking that really caused our changes in, in smoke a lot of the changes in smoking prevalence we've seen entirely now that's all on the um, extensive margin of whether you're a smoker or not there's also some interesting stuff going on in the intensive margin I mean smokers stop dropped their cigarette consumption from 30 plus cigarettes a day, like a pack and a half, more like a pack these days. Um, 
people are quitting at younger ages. And if you quit young enough, you get back almost all the life years lost. You avoid almost all the risk. Uh, people shifted from filter, unfiltered cigarettes to filtered cigarettes, from, low tar, from high tar cigarettes to low tar cigarettes. Now, a lot of this stuff that happened on the intensive margin there didn't necessarily help. In fact, the filtered market share and the low tar cigarettes famously didn't help reduce the health consequences of, of smoking. That's not my point. My point is that smokers were willing to change their behavior to become healthier, even though those, those changes didn't help. So now we're in this new frontier where there's harm reduction products. Of course, they're nicotine replacement products. They're e-cigarettes, which reduce the, the, the carcinogens and toxins and present in combustible stuff and combustible smoke because the, all that stuff comes from combustion. They're the byproducts of combustion. And therefore, when you switch away to e-cigarettes that never burn tobacco, you have eliminated an awful lot of the harm of smoked tobacco. Uh, recognizing this, the FDA and recognizing research along these lines, the FDA Center for Tobacco Products has authorized a form of smokeless tobacco as a reduced risk product and authorized a heat not burn product as a reduced exposure product. Now, you know, this evidence is still controversial, but you know, a lot of it is coming from this toxicological analysis of vapor versus tobacco smoke as well as observational data. Observational data certainly played a big role in the Swedish snus application, for example. They had lots of data from Sweden where, uh, you know, for example, the rates of even mouth cancer, which is and oral cancers, which are associated with smokeless tobacco, are lower in Sweden where they use a lot of snus than in other Scandinavian countries where they smoke more. So there's pretty impressive observational data and toxicological data. We do lack RCTs, um, particularly when we think about trying, you know, are, is, are e-cigarettes safe? How bad are they compared to doing nothing? Obviously, it's unethical to randomly assign people to uh, vape cigarettes um, and then see what happens to them after years. And that always leaves, you know, us reasonably concerned. But I just want to emphasize that there are other ways to figure out causality without RCTs. Um, Here's another unproven harm reduction product from a fun article in the BMJ um, back in 2003, pointing out that we don't actually have RCTs of whether parachutes save lives, um, but I think most of us are pretty confident that they do. So with that background, let me switch to, move to study one. And study one is about this online discrete choice experiment that we designed to try to develop to see the impact of possible FDA regulations on e-cigs, including warning labels, flavor availability, and the, and the price was more of a, a general product attribute we wanted to study. The smokers were, the subjects were all adult smokers. I really like the idea of DCEs as, because they provide data and settings where we just don't know what, we don't have any markets, so we can't do sort of standard econometric studies of how people are behaving in markets. So we just haven't seen these policies. Uh, Jody Sindelar at Yale and others are doing a lot of DCEs as well. C as well. Shang, one of the organizers of this session, is also this seminar series has also done them. Um, after the DCE, and this is a trick I learned from Jody Sindelar that you know you don't want to ask the, you don't want to ask questions before the DCE because that could contaminate the results. But afterwards, we asked it a bunch of questions about the subjects, and we asked how much they knew about the health hazards of tobacco, e-cigarettes, and nicotine replacement therapy. And we can use those in our cost-benefit analysis of policy scenarios. Um, so here's a table two from our, table, uh, from our paper, which is um, just forthcoming in, the, um, in health economics. I added for this presentation red showing the mistakes People are actually are pretty good about figuring out the relative risk, the, the absolute risk, I should say, of combustible cigarettes. The question is how many, out of, out of 100 users of cigarettes, how many will die of a smoking-related illness, you know, of an illness or disease because they smoked? And 45.7% is the average, and that's pretty close to um, scientific estimates. But people are way out of line 
on the dangers of e-cigarettes and NRPs. Now, we're not exactly sure what those are, but they're much, much less than 30%. And I think this, what this reflects is the perception that, for example, um, manufacturers of nicotine replacement therapies have been struggling with for a long time, where a lot of smokers think that nicotine is the problem. And so I've heard the story from um, nicotine from executives in NRT companies that, you know, smokers say, well, why should we switch to the patch? Why are we going to die from cancer from that? We'd rather just die from cancer or smoking. They don't realize that, as was said long ago, people smoke for the nicotine but die from the tar. Um, and so that, that's the misperception that's driving a lot of the misinformation about um, e-cigarettes and NRPs or NRTs, depending which way you want to say that. So I skipped over all the econometric model and estimates that's in the paper. Just want to show you all the simulations that we created out of this. You know, we compared what was happening under pre-2016 FDA market conditions to a bunch of different counterfactuals. Um, you can just see all these numbers here. There's a lot of stuff going on there. So let me just go to the next slide where I kind of give you the takeaways. Based on our estimated econometric model, we predict that correcting mis risk misperceptions could decrease smoking and increase e-cigarette use. Um, we conclude and title the paper that FDA e-cigarette regulations appear to be mostly harmless. The warning label doesn't really change much, but some warning labels like the one that the Mark 10 e-cigarette was using voluntarily was so scary that actually our results suggested it might have increased smoking if the FDA had gone to a warning label like that. Um, the FDA's recent flavor ban, we conclude, probably won't change adult smokers' behavior much. Although I do note that the, all this was collected pre-Juul, so it's hard to know how the results totally extrapolate. Um, banning e-cigarettes entirely, which sometimes has been caught, happened or has been discussed and actually sort of was proposed in some states last fall, uh, we estimate would increase smoking, while we estimate that the $3 e-cigarette subsidy passes the cost benefit test in the sense basically that we're trying to get to the optimal level of you know, what, how much we would see if people were well informed and didn't have behavioral biases like being biased towards the present. And an e a $3 e-cigarette subsidy is about, gets something close to that. Um, that concludes my study one, so I'll pause here I think for some, any comments um, from Justin. Yeah, there's uh, one question and also one maybe that I would throw out. Um, this was a question about the $34 of um, cost that smokers impose on themselves. Uh, somebody was asking how much is that a cost to the smoker and how much is the cost to society in terms of like higher insurance or overall medical costs? That's a very good question, a very controversial question. That's just the value. You know, they, they, they basically just took like the value of a statistical life, turn it into like a value, a values of quality, qualities. So that's basically all the, it's the value that's internal to the consumer. It doesn't take into account some other externalities. So, you, so you, the commenter is right. I really should adjust that upward. Um, though in a lot of these things, the value to the, cons that value is so high that, um, right off the top of my head, I'd guess, you know, maybe 10% if you added some of the other externalities. And so then it seems like you give a causal interpretation to differences between smokers and vapors in their optimization errors that you showed on the previous slide in terms of like um, present bias and commitment that's based on survey responses. And I, I was wondering if that could also just be due to selection of di differences who of people who prefer e-cigarettes versus uh, cigarettes um, or even noise. Now, I'm wondering if it's not causal, sort of how that might affect your estimates, if you have thoughts about that. Uh, that that's a very good point. You know, most, uh, you know, one of the beauties of the discrete choice experiment is that when we look at the choices about label, the effects of labeling, the effects of price, the effects of flavor availability, those were experimentally varied. So they're clearly exogenous in the experiment. But as you point out, the effects of information and the effects of present bias were not experimentally varied. So actually in our, 
paper, we're kind of careful to make that distinction in the wording we use. It's, it's more of an association. Um, if, if you want to be, you know, strictly speaking, I mean, we, we could, but did not, or somebody could in the future develop a discrete choice experiment that would more try to experimentally vary information and present bias. And the way you do that would not be, you can't assign somebody, here's what you think, but you can give them some prompts that would, are shown, can be shown in other ed studies to sort of like, you know, make somebody a little bit more, less present biased, and then see how that changes their choices. But that's not what we did, so you're right. Those results should be viewed with a little bit of question about whether they're causal or just associational. And then just one more, and then we'll, we'll maybe move on. Um, can you explain a little bit more the $3 subsidy? That, that was one of your policy simulations. Right. Uh, so, um, you know, we estimated the price elasticity. You know, we, we gave, we, we experimentally varied the price of e-cigarettes and other products. Right? E-cigarettes, actually, and just, just e-cigarettes. And so we know how responsive smokers are to prices in, in our experiment. Then based on that responsiveness, we simulated what would happen if they saw a $3 subsidy, if they saw a $3 price drop. And, we and when we estimate that, we find, okay, well, it actually would increase e-cigarette use and decrease smoking. It also, um, let's see what it does. I forget what it does to, um, it decreases NRT use a little bit too. Um, but the big deal is it decreases smoking and increases e-cig use. And what it ends up with is consumer behavior that looks a lot like what would happen if everybody were well, what we estimate would happen if everybody were well informed and not present biased. And so in that sense, we say, okay, so this $3 subsidy looks like about the right subsidy to use. That, that result is sort of, uh, a happy coincidence. We, did, we chose the $3 subsidy and then realized afterwards, we chose to simulate the $3 subsidy and then saw, hey, that's a, that looks like it's, it's pretty close to the optimal. The optimal e-cigarette tax is a is negative $3, is a $3 subsidy. Great. In the interest of time, I think we should keep going. Okay. All right. So study two is this paper that came out in the Journal of Health Economics um, in 2019, done with a bunch of people at the NBER group, Mike Grossman's group. Um, and the title of the paper is, does e-cigarette advertising encourage adult smokers to quit? And the spoiler alert answer, you know, yes, it does. I mean, you might, I could say maybe it wouldn't be much of a paper, but actually it, it was a good paper in any case, but also we found it was true for TV ads, but not magazine ads. To give a little background, in the United States, unlike a lot of other countries, e-cigarettes are allowed to advertise on TV and magazines and anywhere, basically. Um, you know, that seems sort of surprising since TV ads for East and radio ads for cigarettes have been banned, you know, since way back in 1972. But basically because of the way they came onto the market, they, they, there was kind of a loophole. They were not treated like a tobacco product until the FDA's 2016 deeming rule. So when they, up through the data we use here and up to 2016, and um, they've been able, they were able to advertise. However, there was litigation um, the FDA said, you know, these e-cigarettes look like a nicotine uh, like a delivery system, and they and they have, but we haven't approved them as a nicotine delivery system. And the um, e-cigarette manufacturer's legal response was, no, who said anything about um, delivering nicotine? We're just a product that we're not saying it's any healthier. We're not saying it helps you quit. We're not a medical product at all, we're just a product. And that kind of led to a truce legally that as long as they didn't say anything about health or cessation, they were allowed to keep on advertising. And this results in a form of advertising that economists have called image advertising, where sort of by the legal constraint, e-cigarette manufacturers are not giving any information in the ads. They're not really saying anything in the ads, they're just showing you know, attractive people in attractive places and e-cigarettes and saying, this is the kind of thing that will happen to you if you get to use e-cigarettes, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't actually say they're healthier, though, you know, sometimes the implicit messages, obviously the advertisers are trying to get that across. Um, now this advertising situation will change once the 2016 FDA's deeming rule 
um, goes fully into effect. But just, um, you know, this is advertising has been a big deal. It increased sort of from nothing around 2010 or very little to over $100 million in 2014. It bounced around a lot, which helps us. Um, here's some charts that show, a chart that shows the amount of both TV advertising and the length of the ads. Um, if you notice, you know, if you're a little bit confused about some of the spending and the lengths, um, one of the things that there's another dimension or another margin that the advertisers have here, and that's where they advertise and how much they spend. So in some early years, they were advertising on some pretty obscure TV shows that was cheap, but they weren't reaching many people. Um, then they switched to advertising on some more widely viewed shows. By the way, at least a couple of years, they've run ads during the Super Bowl, which are really expensive. And so that's why you don't see, uh, you know, why you see sort of independent variation in how long the ads are versus how much they're spending. Now this, I mean, this is maybe more of the methodological point that I was interested in that, um, you know, I love the fact that in his undergraduate textbook, Ernie Barrett uses advertising and consumption as a textbook example of simultaneous equations. So I can say it's literally a textbook example, you know, which is causing which. What we use is this, what one of my co-authors, I believe, came up with the title, a label of a saturated fixed effects identification strategy. where We just have all sorts of fixed effects in the econometric model with year, quarter, magazine, program, time slot, and channel fixed effects. Now, this means you have to think really carefully about sort of like what variation is left. You know, it's, once you put in a fixed effect, we know it's a within variation. So what's the within variation we're using? Well, we're using within program, within time slot, within channel variation and ads. It happens over time, special to that time slot, because we're, of course we're controlling for general time effects with the year quarter fixed effects. So as an example, someone who watched the Big Bang Theory back in 2015, quarter one, was exposed to almost four times more ads than somebody who watched it in the previous, a year previously. Now this builds off both an approach that I would, you know, I was gonna sort of, sort of take credit for it in our paper in the JPE, when we looked at smoking cessation products, just magazines. Um, but actually, in some sense, I think who really get, deserves a lot of the credit was the, um, was, um, the referee for the JPE, and as well as the editor of the referee who said, you know, you can get it published if you can convince us that you've really identified causal effects. And that pushed us to figure out a somewhat simpler version of the saturated um, fixed effects identification strategy. But here's the kind of variation we're using with that, like that dotted blue line shows how much more smoking, how much more ads somebody who watched the Big Bang Theory was in different years. And again, just to you know, drive it home is that, you know, we don't want to say we're going to compare Big Bang watchers to um, Bones watchers. Those people might be, you know, people that watch those different shows might be different types of people, and they might be more or less prone to buying e-cigarettes regardless. But it's the within variation among Bones watchers that we use that variation, or the within variation in Big Bang Theory watchers that we use that variation to identify. What do we find? Well, we estimate this, it's really a small, very small, it's 1% of a cessation rate, which is a small thing to begin with, less than 10% to begin with. I'll mention though, to begin with that, you know, if you actually found a large advertising effect, it wouldn't be credible because if you're finding a large advertising effect in equilibrium, it's sort of suggesting that the companies probably could make a whole lot more money if they advertised more. So you sort of expect them to advertise up to the point where the marginal ad doesn't have very much extra impact um, when they're making profit maximizing decisions about how much to advertise. So we estimate that a complete advertising ban would have decreased smoking cessation by, you know, not very much from 9% to 8.7%. But I think the, I think there are two things to think about. You know, one is that in any case, you've got, a public, a private firm's advertising this product just trying to make money and they've got this public health spillover that they've decreased, they've increased smoking cessation rates a little bit. 
And moreover, if they could actually advertise that their products are helpful for smoking cessation and they're actually less, health, less harmful than cigarettes, um, they could have maybe even a much bigger effect. Um, so this is my point that the pursuit of private profits could promote public health. That's almost a tongue twister, but I'll leave it there. Um, so I think, think again, this is what this is the, the takeaways I want you to take from the second study. And again, um, let me stop here and see if there are any questions. I am not seeing any questions specific to this paper. You are so clear, I, I think, in your uh, explanation. Um, so let's just keep going. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I, again, I'll thank my co-authors for that, uh, having such clear uh, material in the paper to draw on. So in the third study, the third study is both partly published and partly in progress. Um, the paper that, again, I'll give my colleague Alan Matthews credit for the title, News That Takes Your Breath Away. We wanted to study what happened to people's risk perceptions during e -Valley. Uh, Probably a lot of people in the audience know, but just for the record, you know, e -Valley is the I'm experimental approach, but here we're saying, hey, this is an information shock that hit the cigarette market last September. Um, I just got a message that my internet connection was unstable, which means I probably cut out there for a little bit. Uh, you did a little bit for me, but, but I can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I was talking about the E Valley outbreak, which happened um, in, it peaked in September 2019. And in February of 2020, in the final CDC update about the outbreak, they estimate that there were 2,807 hospitalizations, or I shouldn't say estimate, they reported to the CDC of almost 3,000 hospitalizations and 68 confirmed deaths. Now, although they referred to it as e-cigarette, um, after a while, the CDC changed its warnings to really emphasize THC-containing products, because it's almost certain that that's the cause. It really seems to be related to THC and especially vitamin E acetate that was added to THC products. And that seemed to be the problem. Um, very recently, last week, um, some reports came out from a lab that was doing studies about e-cigarettes where they said, well, we seem to have created something like E-Valley in our subjects. Um, their subjects were rats. And in 14 of the 18 rats exposed to this e-cigarette vapor that did not have THC developed acute respiratory distress. One of them had to be put down. Um, and this all happened when the lab switched its e-cigarette heating element from, I think, a stainless steel to a nichrome or something um, heating element. Um, I emphasize this, the, um, intensity of what happened to the rats on purpose, because I think this shows why this might not explain e -Valley in humans that happened last year. And that is that if it were that big, um, it, it wouldn't have taken the CDC long to figure it out and lots of things were happening. You know, almost all the rats were being hurt by this e-cigarette vapor produced with their new technology. So either they were exposing the rats to something a whole lot worse um, than the than humans are exposed to, or it was something more specific to the, the experimental conditions of this rat study. So you know, it's always good to do new research, but again, as far as I know, all the evidence suggests that E. Valley was caused by the the THC. And I'm just again, I should have mentioned THC. Of course, is the psychoactive ingredient or prop or um, component of marijuana smoke not nicotine. So the commercially produced nicotine vaping products um, probably almost certainly do not cause e-valley. But in any case, it was a big information shock. So what we did was we studied, um, well, we took advantage of the fact that the HINT survey, the health information um, something survey, I forget exactly what all the letters stand for, had been asking people about the relative harms of cigarettes and e-cigarettes 
back since 2012. So we ran out and did online surveys starting in right around September 2019 when the Valley crisis was going on um, that used the exact same question. And what we saw was a big jump off trend that slowly over time, the fraction of consumers who said they thought were e-cigarettes were more harmful had been growing from 2012 through 2019. But it sharply jumps up in 2020 or late September 2019 and then in 2020 um, after the Avali crisis. So this is what we think is the, the information shock here that people now are much more likely to think that e-cigarettes are actually more harmful than cigarettes, you know, where the truth, again, the, act, the science is that they're, they're less harmful. Exactly how less harmful, it's hard to know, but they're certainly less harmful and they're certainly, almost certainly, again, not, you know, not more harmful. Um, here's what was happening just in our data that we collected in 18 through 19. We actually, by the way, just did an anniversary issue of those surveys um, a couple of weeks ago in 2020. So we have a whole year of people's perceptions. And you can see over that year, there's a slight downturn. I think the big thing is, is that, you know, even after, say, January of 2020, when the CDC was saying this was due to um, this was due to uh, THC products. Um, people's perceptions of the risk of e-cigarettes never dropped, and we ran two different versions of the survey, either mentioning or not mentioning THC, and it never really mattered. So basically, this information shock, although it should have been specific to vaping marijuana e-cigarettes instead seems to have been taken as a generic information shock that all e-cigarettes are more dangerous than we used to think they were. And so and it, that's interesting um, about how hard, or, you know, what happens to information, I think it's just a, in our paper that's published in the Journal of Risk and Uncertainty, we frame all this in a Bayesian up learning model, um, very similar to some models that uh, Kip Fiscusi has discussed for thinking about things like this. And we're also now trying to look at what's happening to e-cigarette um, sales in this information shock. And you'll see here in a very pretty graph that some things happened, um, but also there's all sorts of other things happening. Um, but look at the mint sales and how they start dropping right after that line. The line shows the Valley shock. So there's a drop in sales due to Valley. Uh, the same thing shows up in the blue line of flavored e-cigarettes, the red line of tobacco flavored e-cigarettes. You don't see too much in the menthol e-cigarettes, a tiny bit of a drop. So that's the Valley shock. Then what happens? Well, you know, the world, I don't think anybody will be surprised at all. The world's been kind of shocking recently. Even back September and even last, back last fall, there were lots of shocks to the e-cigarette market. So last fall, Juul took it voluntarily withdrew its mint cigarettes, e-cigarettes, say, based on data that was showing that the mint was a very popular flavor among youths. So the mint flavor e-cigarettes drop almost to nothing or drop to nothing um, by 2020. At the same time, and presumably because mint and menthol are very similar, menthol sales just jumped way up. So that's what's going on there. Um, you also see a jump up some in, in other flavored e-cigarettes, though then another shock in early January, the FDA started enforcing what's a scent very similar to a ban on flavored e-cigarettes. So we can talk more about the details of that regulation, regulatory approach if we need to, but you know, think of it, it's almost like a ban and you can see it dropping. Um, and then again, though it did not ban menthol cigarettes, so you see menthol cigarettes continuing to rise, as well as tobacco flavored e-cigarettes continuing to rise. Um, there's another thing that's also going on during all this, and that is in December, late December of 2019, um, they changed the um, purchase age to 21 nationally. Um, but these are cigarettes, e-cigarettes e purchased by people of all ages, so it's kind of hard to disentangle um, what might have happened among youth 
e-cigarette purchases from all this. But you see, as I said, you know, we've, we've got a lot of info, we've got a lot of things going on here. We really wanted to focus on that information shock, but we captured a lot of other shocks in our data as well. So the takeaways from this study are that E-Valley was a nice information shock, that there's lots of other things going on. We made some preliminary calculations where we estimated the relationship between people's perceptions of the risk of e-cigarettes and their quit behavior. And we're estimating that because, or the, the, we estimate that the increase in the perceived risk of e-cigarettes is likely to reduce people quitting smoking. And this could be um, as much as 212,000 fewer quitters each year. Um, before I break for comments, let me just show you the last slide. Our work in progress is extending the analysis to 2020. And of course, in 2020, we had yet another big shock, you know, the biggest shock of my lifetime, and that's COVID-19. So here's what's happening to the cigarette market in 2019. And, I am, and I'm really excited about this research. As you can see, it's very striking that what happened after COVID-19, huge increase in purchases, followed by a huge plunge in purchases, presumably because people stockpiled. And fitting that stockpiling behavior, all of a sudden, lots of people, lots more people started buying cartons of cigarettes that are 10 packs to the carton, instead of buying them by the, um, buying them by the pack. So this is the next huge shock that we have to study um, and that we're, we, we're starting to study now and we're starting to get some pretty exciting results. Um, but I don't have much to share with you right now about that. But like I said, I think this, this is sort of the shock that's on all of our minds and it's pretty interesting. All right, now I'll take a stop back and um, let's, for more comments. Okay, great. I'll ask a couple of comments that are specific to paper three, and then I'm going to uh, turn it over to Catherine to ask, uh, give her a chance to ask questions. Um, I'm actually just going to bundle these all together since they're, they're um, I think, related. So w one person said, um, there's a Morningside survey that found that the percent of Americans who thought THC vaping had anything to do with the valley declined, and the percent who thought nicotine vaping was the cause increased. Um, so that, that's, I, I think, presumably over the same time period as your survey. Um, that's a comment. And then two questions was, uh, are your data showing that menthol has become a substitute for other flavored e-cigs? And uh, what's the data sor source for that graphic that you showed? Um, that, referring to that same one showing the changes in vaping sales over time. Okay. Um, no, that, that, that's, very, that's very interesting. We didn't, the way we ask about the menthol, we could, I mean, not the menthol, the um, THC, we couldn't really see that trend, but that's a very interesting trend. And it's, it's, it puzzles me. I think though, I mean, does, I mentioned how many shocks were happening. It was very interesting last fall. And at that point in time, I was in DC. I was even, I was over in the West Wing in the Roosevelt Room, which is right across from the, uh, uh, the Oval Office with um, Admiral Girard from the, uh, the, um, of the Public Health Service and others talking about federal responses to, uh, about e-cigarettes. And all sorts of things were happening at once. There was this information coming out about that lots of teens were smoking, were, you know, huge increase in teen vaping, I mean, um, there's discussion about banning flavors, there's discussion about banning e-cigarettes, and then there was the Valley crisis. And so I think basically there's so much this public discussion and so much action, I'm not too surprised that um, people sort of basically got confused and thought that, um, you know, it was e-cigarettes in general and not THC that was specific. Um, yes, it does look like in these data here, it does look like menthol is substituting for other flavors. Um, these data are from the Nielsen retailer scanner data. So these are sales data that a large number of retailers um, provide to the Nielsen company um, about how much they, all their, all their sales. Now the scanner data don't capture certain types of outlets, certainly and in, in particular about flavors, they don't capture vape shops. And even after the FDA's regulation changed in 2020, early 2020, basically the regulatory approach the FDA took 
was to sort of crack down on flavored sales outside of vape shops, but it let, left the vape shops alone. So there are some fla sales of flavored cigarettes going on in vape shops that are captured in these data. But in these data, in the other types of retailers, um, there was, looks like the big substitution towards menthol once other flavors went away. Catherine, do you want to jump in? Should I stop sharing my screen or? Uh, yeah, I, I would say you can continue to share in case uh, there are particular slides that we want to come to. Okay. Catherine, we can't hear you. No. I'm still yeah. not able to. Now I think I can hear you. Sorry, there must have been a technology problem. Apologies. Um, thanks so much, Don, for that talk. Really appreciated it. I just have a couple of maybe bigger picture questions just for your thoughts for the field. Given all of these changes that are going on in terms of policy, the private market, um, what do you think that the research community emphasizing quasi-experimental and experimental methods, what do you think are the most useful things that we could be doing to further this discussion? What areas are the, should we be thinking about? Hmm. <laughs> That's a tough one. I mean, um, I mean, I guess partly because, as you correctly put out, you know, the research, I didn't point out, the research community and that research approach relies on quasi experiments. And so at some point, in some level, some ways we're you know, the hostages of what the world gives us, what policymakers give us. And one of the frustrating things that, you know, I've felt, you know, for a long time, actually, in th thinking about trying to do research on tobacco marks is, is that, you know, policymakers don't try one thing at a time, they try a bunch of things. So, you know, they banned flavor, the FDA effectively banned flavors and lots of e-cigs, but then they also increased the, um, the, um, the, the purchase age to 21. And so that, you know, the, the timing there is a little bit different. So we might be able to sort of ferret that out, but it's hard. And then, and then again, nature gave us this COVID disaster, which further changes things. So, you know, the data in the National Youth Tobacco Survey shows that, you know, a big change in trend that, you know, after year after year, while the e-cigarette vaping was really taking off, the data from last spring finally show that, you know, big drop back down, though it's still pretty high. Um, which, of the natural ex which, which of the natural experiments was the cause of that is pretty hard. I actually think, and I'm going to try to pursue this in my own research, but I hope, I think I would encourage the field to be thinking about this too, that there may be a lot of value to cross country comparisons. Because when you think about, you know, I, I was talking about what kinds of experiments nat nature gives us. Well, policymakers across different countries have given us an incredible range of experiments about vaping, ranging from the UK, where the National Health Service is promoting e cigarettes as a way to quit smoking, all the way to some other countries where they've totally banned e cigarettes. And then sometimes there are bans of certain types of products and not other types of products. So like in Japan, they ban e-cigarettes, but not heat, not burn. And heat, not burn has become a very popular kind of product in Japan. And so I'm not totally sure how to do those cross-country studies because it's hard, you know, we, it's hard to treat, in the US, we, we treat states like laboratories, but we think, you know, we can look at, but, um, other than that, we think, you know, the people in the US, different US states are similar enough that they're not too confounded. But you know, when we study Japanese vaping and, and use of the heat not burn products and compare that to you British subjects and Australian subjects and Americans, you know, even though they're all different, they're all subject to different policies, environments are also very different, lots of other influences on them. But I, but I, I think, again, that might be one of the big picture areas I would like to see the field go. Thank you. Uh, just kind of a contrawise question. Uh, is there some other areas that maybe we know enough or 
would not be informative and perhaps the experimental quasi experimental research communities or anywhere we maybe we should think twice about uh, investing our time and our resources in or is it sort of we need to know more everywhere <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the value of information is always positive, but yeah, I see the point. I, you, you did say experimental, by the way, and I should have mentioned too that I also think there is a lot of value to the discrete choice experiments. I think, again, because that's a way to find out policy, the, you know, how people behave in environments we just don't see in the world. But, you know, that carefully combined with real world data, and, and um, there's been some nice work um, I'm blanking on the guy's name, but, um, but is, th there's been some nice work done um, on the comparisons of discrete choice experiments and how to sort of integrate them in. Um, I mean, I guess I kind of think I mean, maybe this was a message from my first couple, my earlier point about the importance of information. I know that prices are near and dear to all economists' heart, and their and taxes change prices. So there's this impulse among economists to focus on taxes and prices. I'm not sure that's the big deal here. Um, the tax hikes we've seen in cigarettes, I argued, was not as big as the information changes. And the e-cigarette tax taxes have been mainly small compared to you know, the stuff that's going on here with changes in, price, in the availability of different things, you know, the e-valley shock, and then the flavor shock. And so, you know, that those kinds of changes, I think, are are really important. And I think taxes might start being kind of a second order. So, you know, if, if, if I were to sort of prioritize research, I would say we, we might know enough about taxes or it's not the highest value added research right now. That's great. Thank you. Um, I'd love to uh, leave some time for our audience members, but uh, perhaps if you do have time at the end, you can just uh, give us a, a quick comment on your uh, colonelship in the Kentucky. <laughs> I'd all like to know about that, but thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we, we have a few questions, Don. We're, we're currently on um, paper three, so maybe I'll, I'll stick with this because there were a few questions that didn't uh, we didn't have time for. So. One is on the takeaway slide, you say there, there's 212,000 fewer quitters. Um, the question was whether that's uh, quit attempts or successful quits. Um, and I'm going to bundle one other question with this. Um, can your data disentangle the effects of the Valley information shock on uh, smokers' decisions to, to take up e-cigarettes among dual users versus those who had completely switched um, to vaping? And can you separate out youth versus adults in, in your data? Okay, let me, I think a bunch of questions there, let's see. So the, the, the estimate was about successful quits, though it's a very preliminary estimate. Um, we're, we were looking at just smokers and seeing how they, and, and, but then a successful quit would be somebody who was then starting as a smoker and then switch, quitting smoking combustibles. Um, so they're now either a single user of e-cigarettes or then, and then maybe if we don't know how long they stay e-cigarettes. Um, our data are only for adults. We don't have youth. I think those are the key questions they ask. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so, so then jumping to back to paper one, uh, one question was about uh, how, do, how would you factor in the wide variation in e-cigarette products in, in the market? Um, when uh, thinking about how to interpret this, uh, and then uh, current uh, smokers who either try ends and become dual users, sort of how dual use uh, might might affect this as well. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I think you know I, I, this is where you know, discrete choice experiments. I mean, I think there are, are a lot of them out there, and I think there need to be and should continue to be a lot of these. DCEs about e-cigarettes because precisely because there's so many different types of products. Um, we gave the, the smokers a choice of a certain, we described a certain type of product. I believe it was a disposable product. Um, and then later on at the end, we asked as a follow-up question, would it have mattered if it were, for those of you who had experience with other types of products, refillable products, would, the, would your answers have changed? And 
we didn't find much there, but you know, that's obviously not, you know, not maybe as good as a DCE that more fully explore, explored a whole range of products. So we explored some things, obviously, the availability of flavors or not, but you could also imagine, and some people started to be doing this, um, you know, doing DCEs that had much more product variety. Um, in some sense, a DCE is all about dual use, at least our DCEs were, and I think most of the DCEs done, because everybody in there is a smoker, and this is just asking them under what consideration, under what condi market conditions would they pick up an e-cigarette instead of a, a pack of cigarettes. But, you know, probably in the DCE, we're not picking up permanent cessation and switching. So it's probably kind of all do, dual use. Though there again, you know, when we were doing this study and until recently, almost everybody who was an e-cigarette smoker was e-vapor, e was either a current or former smoker. Um, these days, that's changed, especially for youth and young adults. So now, there's a you, you could probably get a reasonable sample of people that have never tried combustible cigarettes and only use e-cigarettes, and that would be very interesting to see if those people are different than smokers who are then switching to e-cigarettes or dual using with e-cigarettes. And there's a question uh, related to your ongoing work on, on COVID um, about how you would hypothesize that smoking behavior would change um, during the, in the short and long run. Um, yeah, I mean, we have multiple hypotheses that we're exploring. I mean, the one that I'll say based on this graph, I think is easiest to think is a really interesting experiment in stockpiling and carton purchase. I mean, in data in a cross section, smokers who buy cartons smoke more, but that's they probably buy cartons mainly because they smoke more. But what if we ex exogenously impose you to have a carton of cigarettes around the house now? Now, if you're a time inconsistent person, having those cigarettes there might actually increase your total smoking. And you know, again, you and um, this is one of the reasons to think about trying to, you know. Um, Well, so I think this is one of the things we're, well, one of the hypotheses we'll be testing is, you know, are smokers who went out and stockpiled early on, are what we're seeing there, do we, is what we're seeing there just a inventory model where they went out and bought a lot of cigarettes, used them up, and then, um, but they didn't smoke totally more over that period, or are we seeing that there actually was an increase? Um, so far, we think we've actually seen some, a small increase in total smoking, but we need to ferret that out and figure out is it due to the stockpiling story I just told, or is it due to other stories like, hey, I'm now I'm working from home and I don't have to worry about the boss who won't let me smoke. Great. Um, so I, I think we're just about out of time. So maybe I'll, I'll just let you if you if you have uh, thirty seconds to uh, explain your Kentucky colonelship, <laughs> uh, and then maybe we'll we'll move to Mike to finish up. Yeah, the Kentucky colonelship is a lot of fun. Um, I actually got that through the Kentucky Economics Association, I guess, who nominated me. And I got this um, uh, uh, from the governor of Kentucky talking about um, uh, the docket. It mentioned both the duties and obligations and the rights and responsibilities. And I asked the, somebody involved in getting it for me, you know, what are the duties and obligations? And they said, well, they're pretty much the same as the rights and obligation rights and responsibilities, i.e. zero. So uh, it's, it's just very much an honorary thing. Um, it is the kind of colonel that um, Colonel Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken was. So I, I, am, I have equal, stat, equal rank with Colonel Sanders. With that said, uh, thank you, Dr. <laughs> Ginkle, for your, the presentation and to the moderator and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 125 people for your participation today. Our next seminar speaker is Scott Helpern from the University of Pennsylvania on October 30th. His recent title is Leveraging Loss Aversion and Present Bias to Improve Incentives for Smoking Cessation. You will, you will also receive a survey on your satisfaction with the, survey, uh, with the seminar today. We appreciate the feedback. Thanks again for participating and have a top-notch weekend.